that anybody's testimony that you don't want to leave? Is anybody excited about being in the house of God on today? All right. No, I'm in the right house. Reach out and grab the hand of your neighbor. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, it's once again, Lord, we come now just to say thank you. God, before we come asking you for anything, we just want to thank you for everything. Thank you, Lord, for waking us up this morning. And thank you, God, for starting us on our way. God, thank you for safely bringing us through the rain. Thank you for allowing us to be in your house one more time. God, now we need to hear from you. God, I ask that you touch the minds and the hearts of the hearers that they may receive that which comes from you. Lord, I ask now that you would forgive me. Use these lips of clay. God, I ask that you touch my mind. Give me clarity of thought. God, I ask that you use me. Give me articulation of speech. I've studied, but I need your spirit. I've prayed, but I need your power. So, Lord, I ask now that you'd heal somebody, save somebody, deliver somebody, set somebody free today. God, we ask ultimately that you would be glorified, that the people would be edified, and that the devil would be horrified. In Jesus' mighty name, our soul says amen. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as in creation. The Lord our God is a good God. Can't acknowledge anyone until first I acknowledge the God that made my life, Jesus who saved my life, and to the Holy Spirit that keeps my life. I am indeed grateful. Won't you help me honor our bishop and shepherd of this house, Bishop Dwayne C. Debno. Come on, you can do better than that. Amen. And help me honor Lady Carla as well. Amen, amen. Thank him for allotting and affording me this opportunity to all the preachers that serve in pulpit as well as in pew, to the entire leadership and discipleship of the Morning Star Baptist Church. It's mighty nice to be on the Lord's side. Amen. And let it be known from the outset that I don't take this occasion lightly because God has not called me because of who I am. He's called me in spite of who I am and for that fact I'm indeed grateful. Won't trouble your patience long. There is a word today. It comes from the gospel according to Mark. Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 46. Go and travel to verse 48. If you got it, say, I got it. If not, say, wait for me. I heard you. I heard you. All right. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. Traveling to verse 48. Reading from the New King, the NIV version today. Amen. And it reads as such. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. As you go to your seat, do me a favor, look at the person beside you and say, neighbor, whatever you do, don't miss your shout. That's what I wanna preach, don't miss your shout. Brothers and sisters, every day of our lives, we're presented with a myriad of opportunities. Opportunity is a word that we all love. It's a word that inspires hope, something we wish to have to potentially make our lives better. An opportunity is a single event or occurrence that can enlighten us, edify us, and even change the course of our lives forevermore. Webster defines an opportunity as a favorable juncture of circumstances a good change for advancement or progress, a set of circumstances that make it possible to do something. Synonyms, chance, favorable time, occasion, moment, right set of circumstances. We must take advantage of the opportunities before us to experience something new, something different, and even something more. A few years ago, during the early to mid-afternoon hours, the moon's shadow passed across the U.S. 
causing two to three minutes of night-like darkness on a path from Oregon to South Carolina. This rare solar eclipse was the first one in the U.S. since February of 1979. Life can present us with some rare and unique opportunity. Growing up in Baltimore City, little did I know that I'd have a classmate whose father would later go on to be one of the greatest U.S. congressmen to hold a congressional seat. Life can present us with some rare and unique opportunities. This past week, the Washington Nationals won the National League Championship, marking the franchise's first ever trip to the World Series. Life can present us with some rare and unique opportunities. Oftentimes, real opportunities are the ones we don't immediately see because they come by at the most unexpected, the most inopportune times. Sometimes we can be overtaken by distractions or others' opinions and miss the opportunities that cross our paths. Thomas Edison says it this way, opportunity is missed by some people because it's dressed in overalls and it looks like work. I just said something, maybe you missed it. It says opportunity is missed by some people because it's dressed in overalls and it looks like work. Many people miss great opportunities in life because they've become discouraged by the obstacles in front of the opportunity. See, our approach and attitude when opportunity presents itself can determine our outcomes in reference to that opportunity. Sir Winston Churchill says, a pessimist sees a difficulty in every opportunity, but an optimist sees an opportunity in every difficulty. I just said something again, maybe you missed it. He says, a pessimist sees a difficulty in every opportunity, and an optimist sees an opportunity in every difficulty. Taking advantage of opportunity takes us from a place of wondering what can happen to knowing what will happen. Noticing opportunities are subjective and viewed differently based on perspective. The opportunity for some could be the chance to meet your favorite movie star or musical artist, whereas for another, opportunity can be the first in the family to go to college. Life can present us with some rare and unique opportunities. In life, we're presented with a plethora of possibilities, whether we're conscious of them or not. Opportunity can be packaged in many different forms, sizes, shapes, and colors. Opportunity is some that many desire, but few will seize when presented to them. Opportunity is something that many will covet, but few will prepare themselves for. And regardless of what the opportunity is or who it is for, one thing that's common and consistent is that opportunity is something that you do not want to miss. See, there are times in our lives where we may feel stuck in negative places and positions, yet be amidst the perspective and perimeter of people that have the power to present us with brand new possibilities. When such times occur, do not allow outside observations or obstacles to make you miss your opportunity. Such is the case in the text before us today here in the Gospel according to Mark. We find Jesus has left Galilee and is en route to Jerusalem. Unbeknownst to many, Jesus is on his final journey to Jerusalem. He's on a mission and he won't pass this way anymore. But before he makes his way to Jerusalem, he does a short stint in Jericho. And as he leaves Jericho, the Bible introduces us to a man by the name of Bartimaeus. See, Jesus and his disciples and a great multitude are traveling down the highway from Jericho to Jerusalem, and we learn that Bartimaeus is sitting on the roadside. See, Mark tells us that Bartimaeus is the son of Timaeus and that he is a blind beggar. Bartimaeus' name is a strange Greek, Greek and Semitic hybrid. It's a combination of Aramaic and Greek. His name is derived from Bartima, meaning son of the unclean, See, Bartimaeus is a brother that's brought before us with some challenges in his life. He has a blemished background. His name and his lineage would suggest that he's unclean. But not only does he have a blemished background, but we learn that Bartimaeus is a blind man. See, he's physically disabled because he cannot see. And this is 26 to 30 AD. So during this time, there is no Disabilities Act in place. See, there's no one to ensure that he gets an equal opportunity. No one to ensure that he can live independently. No one to ensure that he's economically self-sufficient. Bartimaeus does not have an advocate. He's blind, therefore he cannot work. And because he cannot work, that makes him a beggar. 
So now he's dependent upon the philanthropy of other people. He's sidelined on the road between Jericho and Jerusalem, and Jericho was in the midst of a fertile, well-watered country. See, it's a place celebrated for its beautiful palm trees and balsam gardens. It's situated along the major trade routes. See, Jericho was an affluent city in a rich and flourishing town. Can't you see it? Bartimaeus is on the periphery of a picturesque place, but he cannot partake in it. Such a perplexing position to be in, on the edge of this elegant and exquisite place, unable to truly experience it because it's a beautiful day, but sadly he cannot see it. So there he is on the side of the road, on the hill of the highway, on the outskirts of this wonderful well-to-do place, and seemingly he's stuck on the sidelines of life. How many times have we seen or been traveling about our way and our abundant postures and coming from our places of affluence, passing by people who are living on the margins of life? See, we may know of them, but we don't know them nor their story. See, some people who are sidelined in life, people are passing them by. Life is passing them by. And no one cares to see or themselves if they're really in need. See, here he is. He's stuck on the roadside of poverty, outside the realm of prosperity. But can't you see him? He's on the side of the road. People are passing him by. So life is passing him by. He's stumbling because he's blind. He's unable to see the obstacles of life before him. People are debating on whether or not they want to help him out or disregarding him altogether. They have no regard, respect, sympathy, or empathy for this brother and his situation. See, he's physically disabled, he's fiscally dependent, and the text says that Jesus, his disciples, and a large crowd are passing him by. I just said something, maybe you missed it. See, Bartimaeus is a blind man. He's brought to us with some problems in his life. He's got a bothered background. He's a beggar because he cannot work. He has nobody looking out for him. Nobody cares if he can live independently. And here it is, he's stumbling because he's blind. He's on the side of the road, and people are debating whether or not they want to help him out. They have no regard, respect, sympathy, or empathy for this brother and his situation. He's fiscally disabled, he's physically dependent, and there it says that Jesus and his crowd are passing by. See, Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, and he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So my question is, Bartimaeus, it seems like you've been in this situation for a long time. What made you do it? What made you know this was the right moment? What made this the right opportunity? Why did you shout for Jesus? How did you ensure that you don't miss your shout? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you my three, then I'm going to take my seat. The first reason that he does not miss his shout is because he's relying on sensory perception. It's in the text, y'all. Jesus is passing by. As we know, Bartimaeus is a blind man. He's unable to see as others can. So he must rely on his other senses to get him through life. See, he's on the side of the road going about his normal daily routine. He's sitting there with his cloak on, and I'm sure he hears the commotion of the crowd coming by. He's listening to the people around him to know that it's Jesus of Nazareth passing by. See, he cannot see, but he can hear. And because he hears things, he probably heard about how Jesus has called ordinary men to ministry. He's heard about how Jesus has cast out unclean spirits. He heard about how Jesus has healed Peter's mother-in-law who was sick with fever. He's heard about how he healed those that were demonically possessed. He's heard about how he cleansed the leper. He's heard about how he healed the paralytic man. He's heard about how he raised Jairus' daughter. He heard how he restored the man with a withered hand. Have you heard about this Jesus? He's heard about how he healed the hemorrhaging woman. He's heard about how he fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread. He heard about how he's walked on water. He's heard about how he unstopped deaf ears. He's heard even about how he opened blind eyes. So he's heard about his track record so he knows who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. See, although he cannot see, that does not affect his ability to hear because he did not allow his disability to hinder his ability. I just said something and maybe you missed it. See, you cannot allow your disability to hinder your ability. See, many times people that have a degraded ability or loss of one of their other five senses, their other senses are augmented to compensate for the loss. See, they rely on their other senses at a deeper level. So while they're on the side of the road, I'm sure that Bartimaeus here 
hears all types of things. So he has to be intently listening for something specific. Y'all ain't feeling, okay, listen. Listen, I'm an engineer by day, preacher by design and destiny. So occasionally I see scientific principles come into play in the text. See, here what I see is the signal to noise ratio. See, signal to noise ratio is a measure in science and engineering that compares the level of a desired signal to the level of background noise. Signal to noise ratio is often used metaphorically to refer to the ratio of useful information to false or irrelevant data in a conversation or exchange. See, often like some folks around us, everything that they say isn't newsily necessary. See, and you've got to learn how to listen for what you need of even in the midst of the noise. And is there anybody in here that can say everything somebody says isn't important, so I've got to learn how to listen for what I need even in the midst of the noise. See, Bartimaeus may not have sight, but Bartimaeus has sense, and his other senses are giving him indications. See, he hears them talking about a man named Jesus. He smells the donkey marching down the road. He tastes the salty sweat that has him anxious. He touches the cloak that he wears every day, but somehow he feels like Jesus is passing by. And that's all right, because eyes have not seen, nor hath ears heard, near hath it entered into the hearts of man. Those things which God has in store for those who love him. So is there anybody in here that can testify that I don't know how and I don't know when, but I do know who and somehow, some way, I feel like my breakthrough is on the way. See, the first reason he does not miss his shout is because he's relying on sensory perception. But the second reason he doesn't miss his shout is because he's rejecting the suppression of the people. See, look at the text. I told you Bartimaeus was introduced to us with some challenges in his life. As he's brought before us, we find out about Bartimaeus' issues before we really find out about him. See, that's how he's described, and that's how many people are described nowadays. We find out about their issues before we find out about, about who they really are. See, he does not have the best set of circumstances. He's got a bothered background. His name is Bartimaeus, son of the unclean. He's a blind man because he cannot see. He's a beggar, which means he's dependent upon other people. And to make matters worse, the people who should be wanting to help him are just belittling him. See, he knows he's in a bad situation. He's on the roadside. He comes to the same place every day looking for others to help him out. He's dependent upon the generosity of other people. He benefits from other people's benevolence. His life is contingent on the compassion and charity of other people. But here it is. He's on the roadside, on the outskirts of this wonderful well-to-do place, living on the margins of life. He's crying out for help, and the people who should want to help him just want to shut him up. See, how many times are people in our midst crying out for help, and we try to quiet their cries for help? See, people in our churches are crying out for help. People in our communities are crying out for help. People in and our families are crying out for help. Children in our schools are crying out for help. And all too often, we ignore their issues, pass over their petitions for prayer, but here it is, Bartimaeus is crying out for help, and they have the nerve to try to calm him down. And too often, there are people in your midst that truly don't care about your hurts or your healing. I just said something, maybe you missed it. Too often, there are people in your midst that really don't care about your hurts nor your healing. See, sadly, they're trying to shut him up, but he won't let them because these people may be willing to give him change, but they don't care whether his life gets changed. I just said something again. Maybe you missed it. See, he said they may be willing to give him change, but they don't care whether his life gets changed. But Bartimaeus says, despite all that, despite my background, I'm tired of being blind. I'm tired of being a beggar. I'm tired of being belittled. I'm trying to get blessed. So Bartimaeus throws his head back and shouts one last time, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me because he recognizes that this is his opportunity. This is his moment. This is his chance. And like the young people, he decides turn down for what? Because he realizes this is it. I've got to do whatever it takes to get Jesus' attention. And is there anybody in here that says I've gotten to the place where despite my background, despite my disability, despite my dysfunction, despite my bank account, I've got to let my pride go. If I got to holler, I'll holler. 
If I've got to fast, I'll fast. If I've got to cry, I'll cry. If I've got to pray, I'll pray. If I've got to scream, I'll scream. I'll do whatever it takes to get his attention because what I need, only Jesus can fix. If there's anybody in here that can shout off the fact that whatever they need, they realize that only Jesus can fix it. See, he realizes his desire has to outweigh their discouragement. You don't allow your critics nor their comments to cause you to miss your life-changing experience. I just said something. Maybe you missed it. You can't allow your critics nor their comments to cause you to miss your life-changing experience. See, he won't let them be the obstacle that makes him miss his opportunity. Leonard Ravenhill says it this way. The opportunity of the lifetime must be seized within the lifetime of the opportunity. I just said something. Maybe you you missed it. Leonard Ravenhill says it this way. The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized within the lifetime of an opportunity. See, but Bartimaeus is thinking, if I can just get his attention, I know that everything will get better. See, he realizes he's got to navigate through his naysayers. He's got to push beyond the pushback. He's got to conquer his critics in life because Bartimaeus knows that Jesus has just what he needs. And is there anybody in here that says, I've got to push beyond the pushback. I've got to get the where I go because Jesus has just what I need. See, don't be discouraged because rest assured, God has just what you need. See, Bartimaeus is blind. Bartimaeus is a beggar. He's been belittled, yet he believes he's in the midst of the one who could bring about change in his life. Uh, despite what other things, he shouts one last time, Jesus, have mercy on me. And the text says that Jesus stood still. I just said something. Maybe you missed it. I told you Bartimaeus was a blind man. I told you he had a bothered background. I told you his name meant son of of the unclean. I told you this brother was physically dependent. I told you he was fiscally dependent. I told you he was blind and therefore he could not work. I told you he's been belittled by other people. The people who should want to help him just want to shut him up. The people who should want to take care of him just want to calm him down. And here it is, he realizes yet all of that, he believes he's in the midst of the one who has the, what it takes to bring about change in his life. I just said something, maybe you missed it. Bartimaeus has got some issues in his life. He's got a bothered background. Bartimaeus, you look him up on K-Search, he might have something on his name. See, he might just like you and he's just like me. Bartimaeus got some issues in his life. He's a blind man. He's a beggar. He ain't got nothing in his bank account. He's got the same cloak on every day. He's in the same place looking for people to help him out. And the same people who should want to help him out just want to shut him down. The same people who should want to help him out just want to shut him up. It might be like church people. They might be the people who are trying to keep you from getting your blessing. It might be like some people in your family. They might try to keep you from getting your blessing. But here it is, despite all that, Bartimaeus says, I believe that I'm in the midst of the one who has what it takes to bring about change in his life. And even though they try to shut him up, even though they try to shut him down, he shouts one last time, Jesus have mercy on me. And the text says that Jesus stood still. See, here it is, this first time in the text that we see people calling for Jesus all through the text, but never do we see them call for Jesus, and the Bible says that Jesus stops in his tracks. Y'all missing it? Uh, look in here, Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 48. It says that eventually, as he calls for Jesus, do you see the woman who had the issue of blood? She reached for Jesus. She pulled on him. We see the soldier who came to him, but this person, he calls for Jesus, and the text says that Jesus stops in his very tracks and stands still. I couldn't understand this because people people calling for him all the time. I mean, this is Jesus, y'all. He's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at the same time. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipotent. That means he has all power. He's the earthly manifestation of a heavenly God. This is God in the flesh. See, he was there telling the sun, when it's your time to shine. He was there telling the moon, now it's your turn. He was there when they hung the stars in the sky. He was there when time began. He moved from Kairos to Kronos in 
and said, Mark Tom, it's your go. He said he knows who's around him. He knows who's in his midst. So what is it about this moment that causes Jesus to stop in his very tracks and stand still? Still couldn't figure it out. I figured I might have to run the list one more time. See, it's not his culture because this isn't his first encounter with someone with a bad background. He's dealt with you and he's dealt with me. Y'all ain't feeling me. This isn't his first run-in with a blind man because he's restored sight before and the people around him are beggars. He's been around those before because even in John chapter 12, he says the poor will be with you always. Then it hit me. It's not his culture. It's not his condition. It's not his cause. It's his cry. He shouted out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the text says that Jesus stood still. First reason he doesn't miss his shout is because he's relying on sensory perception. But the second reason he doesn't miss his shout is because he's rejecting the suppression of the people. But third and finally, lest I keep you too long, he's recognized the sovereign's power. It's in the text, y'all. Again, what about this cry makes Jesus stand still? If you look a little deeper, you realize that Bartimaeus is crying out in faith. He cries out saying, son of David, have mercy on me. See, he has addressed him by his message messianic name. See, nobody else understands or knows him as the son of David, but he addresses him the way no one else has called him. They call for him. They say, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. No, that ain't, that's him. They call Jesus the carpenter's son, Jesus Mary's baby, but no, he calls him Jesus, son of David, and he says, have mercy on me. See, he addresses him as if he has a futuristic understanding of who Jesus really is. See, he addresses him by his messianic name. He says, son of David. So he recognizes who he truly is. See, Bartimaeus is a blind man, but I believe he spiritually has 20-20 vision. See, spiritually, Bartimaeus is in rhythm with God. See, he gets Jesus' attention, and he stands still because he's in syncopation with the Spirit of God that he recognizes who he is without anybody else saying it. He can't see him. He really can't even hear him, but he feels like Jesus is in the room. And after he gets his attention, and Jesus stands still after coming to a halt he commands the people to call him but isn't it something the same people that tried to calm him down are you now utilized to call him for the same people that tried to shut him up now they've got the signal for him the same people that tried to shut him down now must see that Jesus sees about him and this helps me to understand that you've got to be careful how you handle people on the roadsides of life because you never know what role you're going to play later on see life can and present us with some rare and unique opportunities. So here it is. The people call for him and they say, be of good cheer. Rise. That's the King James Version. The NIV says, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. And the Bible says that Bartimaeus, throwing his cloak aside, jumps to his feet and runs to Jesus. I, that just said something. Maybe you missed it. I told you Bartimaeus was a blind man. I told you he had a bothered background. I told you he was a beggar. I told you he was physically disabled. I told you he was fiscally dependent. Bartimaeus has some challenges in his life. And see here the people that should try to shut him down and wanted to shut him up. They got to see that Jesus can see about him. The people that tried to calm him down, now they got to call him forth. And there was, they wanted to hinder him, but now they got to help him to get to Jesus. And when they said that he's calling you, cheer up on your feet. Bartimaeus throwing his cloak aside, jumps to his feet and runs to Jesus. See, I couldn't understand how this blind man could know where to run to. See, I believe that he spiritually has 20-20 vision. I told you Bartimaeus is in rhythm with God. See, he's in tune and he's got the rhythm. So he runs to him now because he's before Jesus. So imagine his excitement, all that he's been through, his past, his background, his physically disabled, he's blind, he's fiscally destitute, because he's a beggar. He's positionally disadvantaged because he's on the roadside. He's been put down in life. He's been belittled, but now he's at the master's feet. And I don't know about you, but that's a good place to shout because no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what your disability is, no matter what's in your bank account, no matter who's walked by you, no matter who's lied on you, no matter who's talked about you, no matter who's belittled you, no matter what you 
you've been through, there's still mercy at the master's feet. And is there anybody in here that can shout off the fact that I've been through some stuff, I've been some places, I've had some issues, but I'm so grateful to know that there's still mercy at the master's feet. High five your neighbor and say, neighbor, there's still mercy at the master's feet. So here it is, he's standing in front of Jesus, but before he gets to Jesus, we learn that he threw his cloak aside and jumped to his feet. And this is something, y'all, because the cloak is significant for a beggar. See, the cloak is part of his identity. He threw his cloak aside because he doesn't want anything to hinder him. See, y'all don't understand. I told you he was a blind man. I told you he was a beggar. I told you he was positionally disadvantaged on the roadside. I told you he was physically disabled. I told you he was fiscally destitute. But here it is. He takes his cloak. It's the same cloak he comes with every day because he doesn't have anything. He's a beggar. This is all he got. This is all he's got. He brings with it every day but when they call for him when they say he can come before Jesus he throws his cloak aside and I said how would you throw your cloak aside he doesn't want anything to hinder him from making it to Jesus see he realized that he can leave his old ways beside because if he knew anything he knew that if he could just get to Jesus then everything would be all right and is there anybody in here that says I can throw some old ways aside because if I can just get to Jesus then everything would be all right. I can leave some old habits below because I can just get to Jesus then everything would be all right. I can let some people go because if I can just get to Jesus then everything would be all right. I can let some old things go. If I could just get to Jesus then everything would be all right. I can let go of some fake friends because if I can just get to Jesus then everything would be all right. And is there anybody in here that can tell Testify, if I just get to Jesus, then everything will be all right. He throws his cloak aside because he makes it where he needs to be. Now he's standing at the master's feet. He's in front of Jesus, and Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He replies, Rabbi, I want to see. Again, he makes a faith statement that shows consistency and confidence. He calls him Rabbi, meaning teacher. He asked to receive his sight. And I said to Bartimaeus, I said, Bartimaeus, what made you think that if you could just get his attention? What made you think if you could just get to his feet? What made you think if you could just get in his presence that everything would be all right? I realized that Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus had a special kind of confidence. How did you know that if you could just get to Jesus, that everything would be all right? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you my little story, and then that's it. See, a few months ago, I was talking with my friends about basketball, and we were talking about the playoffs, and we began to reminisce about the 90s. We talked about the good old days when the NBA was on NBC. Y'all don't remember that? Little Peacock would come up on the side of the stage and say, do do do. Oh, yeah, that was, that was the NBA on NBC. And one thing that would bring about excitement was the team introductions and there was one team that I loved to watch in the 90s y'all figure it out See, the one team that I loved to watch in the 90s, it was, you might have guessed it, it was the Chicago Bulls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the 90s, this was the 3 P era, and the visiting team would get introduced. And as they prepared to introduce the home team, the lights would go out, and the crowd would begin to cheer. The logo would move across the floor, and the people would begin to get excited, and the names would begin to get called. They called Scottie Pippen, and the crowd would go wild. They called Dennis Rodman, and the crowd would go wild. They called Luke Longley, and the crowd would go wild. They called Ron Harper, and the crowd would go wild. But last but not least, they say it like this, standing at six foot six from North Carolina, your shooting guard, Michael Jeffrey Jordan. And just like y'all, the crowd would go wild. But as a kid, I got too excited, and I was running around the house like I was playing for the team. But as I got older, I asked myself, why was everybody so excited? He still had on the warm-ups, and he he hadn't done one thing. The people are growing crazy. He hadn't taken one shot, hadn't dribbled the ball at all. The game hasn't begun, yet the crowd is going crazy. 
couldn't figure it out. Then I had to understand that this was the playoffs. So they weren't responding that way because of that night. They had 82 games of history and a track record of what he could do. So no matter what opponent was on the other side of the court, they realized that he, they could trust that if he could did it before, that he could do it again. And that wasn't just true for the man that wore 23. This was for the man who was 33. See, he had an amazing track record. And I trust that if he's done it before, then he can do it again. And is there anybody in here that can testify that I've got a track record with God? And if he's done it before, I believe he can do it again. I've got history with him. And I believe that if he's done it before, he can do it again. Y'all help me preach. Shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, I'm on assignment to tell you that if he's done it before, he can do it again. You have no idea all the hell I I've been through but if he see you just see the glory but you don't know the story you don't know how we've had the push you don't know the rejection you don't know the obstacles the sleepless nights what we made us cry but we're living witnesses that if he's done it before then he can do it again see don't be discouraged see he's unstopped deaf ears before and he can do it again he's opened blind eyes before and he can do it again He's broken addictions before and he can do it again. He's healed sickness before and he can do it again. He's healed cancer before and he can do it again. He's paid your bills before and he can do it again. He's repaired marriages before and he can do it again. He's restored families before and he can do it again. He's restored communities before and he can do it again. He can move the unmovable, heal the broken hearted, fix a messed up mind and is there somebody in here that knows that he's done it before and he can do it again Shirley Caesar put it this way he'll do it again he'll do it again if you just take a look at where you are now and where you've been hasn't he always come through for you he's the same now as he was then you may not know how and you may not know when but baby I'm here to tell you he'll do it again because I've seen the lightning flash I I've heard the thunder roll. I felt sin breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. But I've heard the voice of Jesus telling me to fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Is there anybody in here that can testify off the fact that he'll do it again? I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're going through. But if you hang on just a little while longer, I promise you, that if he's done it before, he can do it again. Bartimaeus, give your testimony. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, was blind, y'all. Was blind, but now I see. Is there anybody in here that can testify that I've got a witness, I've got a reason to sing. I've got a reason to shout. I got a reason to dance, but I'm not by myself. Do me a favor and grab your neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor, magnify the Lord with me and let us, I said, let us, let us exalt his name together. Can't nobody do you like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Is there anybody in here? Have I got a witness? Won't he make a way for you? Won't he open doors for you? Won't he provide for you? Won't he heal you? Won't he protect you? Won't he fight your battles? Be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will. God will. God has. God shall take care of you beneath his wings of love abide. God will. God will. God will take care of you. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Hasn't he done it? Shout yes. Shout yes. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. I got one last question. Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? 
Ain't he alright? So yeah!